Welcome to Beyond the Chalkboard with Beloit College Athletics, where we sit down with Beloit College coaches to talk history, strategy, and trivia in their respective, respected sports. I'm your host, Owen Clexton, and today I am with Coach Sankson to discuss Beloit College's football program. Thanks for joining us, Coach. Thanks for having me. So we're going to start off with a few background questions, just to get, get a little bit more info for the viewers. Um, when did you first get exposed to football? Uh, six grades when I officially like played organized football, but I grew up, I was fortunate enough to grow up in a neighborhood with a bunch of kids my age. So we were playing, you know, backyard football or park football pretty much from second grade <laughs> on. So football has always been a big part of my life. Yeah. Um, so uh, obviously then you played, you played in middle school and high school. Yep. Uh, just for the local park district, you know, house league stuff. Um, growing up and then got into high school and um, wasn't very good at first. Uh, I went to a very big high school in the Chicago suburbs where I was on the B team and yeah. I wanted to play D-line and it wasn't working out and then I got moved to guard for scout team and I did. I had a good play and then <laughs> from that point forward I realized I was, I was an old lineman but <laughs> I did not join football to play O-line. Uh, but it ended up being a, you know, advantageous for me, worked out, had a great experience playing high school football went on to play college football in the, the same conference as Beloit uh, at a rival school and um, right out of college got my first coaching job. So it, it's, I've been involved in college football pretty much since I was a freshman in college. Like I haven't had a break from it. Yeah, yeah, no, that's, that's an incredible, that's incredible uh, way of getting into the sport, being able to continue on with it like that. What made you want to be a coach? Uh, I think I always had a passion for it. I can think back to even when I was in high school, drawing up, I'd watch like the bowl games and draw up what the plays were, and I'd go meet with my high school coach and ask him what he thought about different things. And I don't think that knew, I knew right then I wanted to be a coach, but I was I was fascinated with the X's and O's of it all. Um, and when I was in college during my work study hours, you know, if I I doodle in my my notebook and draw up a bunch of plays and stuff. So I. I think it was always there. I never had a plan to become a college coach. It was never, I thought I was going to school to become a financial planner. I was an econ major. Um, I did help out at my high school. Like each summer I'd go back and help out at their like youth camps and stuff like that. But it was more just because I wanted to be around my old coaches and it was something to do. I got a little extra money for it. Yeah. Um, and then honestly, when I, when I was graduating, I applied to a bunch of different places, financial planning type jobs and bank jobs and coaching jobs to see if I can get a master's out of it. And honestly, the only job offer I got was a, an intern coaching job and fell in love with it uh, down at McMurray College, which no longer exists, unfortunately, as of now. But it's where I got my foot in the door, and kind of the rest is history. At my first practice, I called my parents and told them this is what I want to do. I figured it out. <laughs> it's amazing what, what, uh, what one, uh, one decision can make lead yeah. you to. Um, what, br what brought you to Beloit in terms of uh, what made you choose Beloit? It was a multitude of factors. Um, it was an opportunity to become a, a head coach for the first time. Um, and it was an opportunity to come to a school that I was familiar with, familiar with the conference, obviously. Mm -hmm. um, not too far from where I grew up. I'm, my, my family, my, my, my dad and my sister only live an hour and 20 minutes away from here in the north suburbs. So I, I was able to take a leap and, and take the next step of my career while not having to move across the country to do it. Um, and then in the end, the selling point, you know, still having to come and interview is, I just saw a lot of potential within the school and the, the, the program and just seeing how the powerhouse was close to being done and uh, that we, we, we were going to be able to get a weight room kind of redone. There's just a lot of positivity during the interview process that made me sell, I guess sold me on the fact that it was, things were going to be going in the right direction and I, want, I, I was excited to have the opportunity to be a part of that. Yeah, I think, I think we've all seen there's definitely been a change in atmosphere around Beloit College in terms of there's a lot of optimism for the future. So I can definitely see why that that would be, play a factor into bringing you here. Um, as a coach, what do you think has been uh, like? You talked about your um, your your first day coaching. You called your parents. You said, "This is what you want to do for the rest of your life." What's been your favorite part of coaching? It's gonna be cliche, but just seeing the how how guys develop, seeing how a freshman can can turn from you know a practice player scout team guy into a, an all-conference starter and see how someone that can come in maybe struggling with their school work and not not understanding what it takes to be successful in college all of a sudden graduates with a you know above a 3.0 like seeing that 
that kind of transformation and also the relationships that are involved in this. I, there's a lot of former players that I'm, I'm, I'm friends with now where I've helped get into coaching. They've actually helped me get different opportunities and things like that. It's just a, a unique brotherhood amongst the coaches and the players that it's a bond that lasts for forever. I mean, in the end, I, I still, I'm still in contact with guys that I coached when I was a 21 year old coach coaching guys that were 20 years old at McMurray College. Like there's still guys that we were one year difference. I was, I was basically yeah. graduated senior and they were going in their senior year and it still clicked. So it's, it's a unique opportunity. Football to me is the greatest team sport in the world. There's no other sport in the world that includes everybody. Like it's, doesn't matter height, weight, fast, small. Um, football can find a spot for you, and that's what I love about it. And that's yeah. it's just cool to be involved with that type of team atmosphere. Yeah, I mean, hey, cl cliches are cliches for a reason. It's because somebody, or at least a majority of people, agree with it. Yeah, there's um, some truth to every one of them. <laughs> yeah. Um, have you found? Has there been anything that surprised you since you've come to Beloit? Um. Honestly, I just really love the area. Like I, yeah. I didn't know what to expect with like being a again. I, I'm from from the suburbs of Chicago, which is you know a lot of people. I, it's, it's every town is thirty thousand people next to another thirty thousand town people. Like this is a, it's not a small town. It's not forty thousand, but around it there's farmland. It's a little bit more rural than I'm used to. Yeah, uh, and I love it. I won't. I literally have no desire to ever move back to the Chicago suburbs. I <laughs> love it here. The, the the speed of life is perfect i don't miss traffic um, but at the same time there's still a bunch of stuff in town to do shops restaurants and then you're you're only 20 minutes away from a bunch of other areas whether it's janesville or rockford and getting to lake geneva like it's it's a nice location where you can get to a bunch of stuff but we're very comfortable just in the town of Beloit. We we really really genuinely just love being here me and my wife and my two kids yeah i mean i, th I think a lot of students at the college uh, will share that share that view of once they get here, they just love it. Mm -hmm. They love the area. And like you said, we're right in the middle of anything. So even if there's something you can't find in Beloit, you're not too far away from finding it. Yep. But there's plenty you can find right here. Now I'd like to dive into a few more uh, strategic questions as a coach. First off, what do you think, what is your, what, briefly, what is your coaching strategy? Um, so I, my background is as an offensive coach, uh, offensive coordinator um, over the past five years now, an offensive line coach. Um, so everything I like to base our offense around is simplified for the offensive line up front, doing three, three or four base run plays with a ton of window dressing with different formations and personnel groups and motions, uh, and then mixing in quick passes, quick screens, uh, double move stuff. And then once we, we continue to grow within the offense, having a West Coast based uh, downfield passing attack, where it's still based on getting the ball out on timing and rhythm with the quarterbacks. Um, but the quarterbacks having the final say, kind of the, the last chance to get us to the right play if there's something not right, being able to count numbers. If it's five men in the box, being able to hand it off. If it's six men, look for, to see what, out, what else is outside. Um, but just trying to get the ball spread out to as many guys as possible and take what a defense is giving up. Like that. Mm -hmm. And the bottom line is I don't want to just bash my head against the wall because I'm, I'm an O-line guy and I want to run the ball. Like, yeah. Yeah, I would love to run for 300 <laughs> yards every single game, but if a team is giving us a bunch of easy passes, let's take care of that. Yeah, I know as a former lineman myself, we love uh, we love we love simple playbook, mm -hmm. and we love running the ball. But definitely, you got to take what you can get sometimes with defenses. Um, how uh, so? Has, your, has this strategy changed at all over time? Have you uh, has it been adjusted at all? I'd say. As a young coach, you kind of you don't have a philosophy. You take, whatever, the old, whatever, whatever, whatever the more seasoned coaches are doing, that's what you are doing. I have been fortunate enough in my career, I have coached in pretty much every version of an offense that there is out there, including the triple option, double wing offense, power eye, 22 personnel, like just power run game right and left over and over again, all the way to full-blown no huddle, five wide, go as fast as you can, never hand the ball off ever. So I've had a mixture of all that in my career. Mm -hmm. So I've kind of gotten to develop it over time, and I like a little bit of all of it. Like yeah. I, and that's why I think I, we have a, my goal is to continue to build a multiple offense. Um, it requires recruiting and getting the right personnel in there and having, having guys that can play in line tight end and have a true fullback, that, but then also be able to go four and five wide. Like I, 
I love like a perfect series for me. If we're running eight plays, you know, 80 yards, eight plays, we're mixing in 10 personnel, 11 personnel, 20, 21, uh, five wide, all that stuff within those eight plays. Just because then the defense has to make adjustments to all of that. Yeah. Um, as far as is it has it stayed the same? I think I've always had the the desire to be multiple. Yeah. But until you become an O coordinator, you don't really know what you're actually going <laughs> to get. And in the end, you, based off your players, like I, I was a really good O coordinator when I had a two-time All-American running back because I can just call run plays and he was going to make something happen. So, in the end, it's still about making the offense fit the players. Mm-hmm. Um. So as a coach, you you have to make a lot of big decisions, especially when it comes to getting up to a game. What's your process like for making that deci- making a decision like that? It's just the preparation throughout the week that leads up to what kind of decisions you're going to make, talking with the assistant coaches throughout the week, what our game plan is, uh, making sure that we're all on the same page of what our philosophy is for that game, what a defense that we're going against is giving us, how the other team's offense looks, what the special teams look like. Every week is different. Like there's, yeah. there's not one week that's exactly the same as the next, and I want to make sure that myself and the assistant coaches are on the same page and that all of our players then are on the same page with what our – our plan of attack is and what we see it as. There might be games where we know we're going to be going forward on fourth down a lot. And so that way when we get to that point where it's a fourth and four on the the 50-yard line, like we already knew back in Tuesday we were going to be going for it just because of how the game flow was going and what our game plan was. And then there's other weeks we know, uh, yeah, our, we're going to lean on our defense. We know our defense is going to make stops. We're punting the ball on that situation. But mm-hmm. it's week to week, opponent to opponent, and it's all about making sure that Sunday through Friday – we have done our homework, and we know on Saturday how it's going to go. I don't think there's a coach across the country that would disagree with that right there. Um, being yourself due to the program, as well as, as a lot of your staff, what kind of changes are you looking to make uh, on the field and off the field? We, we are already well in Even though we've only been here for a year and a half, we've, I think we've made some substantial changes just having an investment in the academic side of things. Um, we, we took over a team that had a low GPA. Um, and we, we built that up to a point where we went from a 2-2 to a 2-9-9 in a year. Um, still plenty of work to do. Goal is to try to find a way to get to a 3.0 every semester. Mm-hmm. Um, but the only way we do that is as coaches invest in it. So we have monitored study tables uh, basically two nights a week with a coach. The guys are turning in their cell phones to that coach, uh, and it's an hour and a half time frame where they are just doing homework and not getting distracted by whoever's trying to talk to them or what's going on, on social media. Um, and then within that, we're able to get our guys set up with tutoring, making sure that they're meeting with uh, TAs. Um, we meet with our guys once a week, um, just about academics. Every first-year student has a uh, required meeting with us in study tables and anyone below a 3.0. Uh, the goal is if we can get everyone out of study tables, then that means we're definitely going to have a 3.0 in the end. Yeah. Um, so that's, that's the biggest investment when I took over. When I, when I saw where the team GPA was, that was my number one thing I wanted to fix. Because mm-hmm. I know if I can fix that, then the attitude changes, the chemistry changes, guys are bought into what we're doing, and then everything else can kind of come along with it. So the next part is I think we're improving the team chemistry, getting guys to have fun playing football again and getting to know each other, uh, and then recruiting, making sure we're bringing in guys that fit what Beloit is. It's one of the best academic schools in the country, so we better find guys that are bought into being academically focused. Yeah. Um, don't, don't want guys that can just play football and don't want guys that just want to be students. We want guys that want to be great at both. Yeah. I mean, I personally, I, I've had quite a bit of experience with the team. I think we, I can definitely say that there is definitely, there has been a big, a big, uh, buy-in in terms of academic production and we can, you can really see the change that you've, you've installed. Um, so you mentioned recruiting. What is the, what do you look for in a potential recruit? Number one thing we, we want is to make sure they have the academic background. So when we reach out to anybody and they show interest in us, um, we ask them to fill out one of our questionnaires so they can show us how actually interested they are in us. Are they willing to actually do some work for us? Uh, and then from that point, we ask them for the transcripts so that way we can actually gauge is this something that fits what we're looking for. Um, and then from that point forward, then we can talk about if we're going to make an offer to them or not. Um, not everyone gets an offer. We are not one of the schools that's just blowing Twitter up with offer after offer. You, you have to be someone that fits what we're looking for academically has shown some initiative that wants to get some stuff work filled out for us and done for us. And then we want to have them on a virtual visit or have them make sure we have a face-to-face conversation, have them in person on visit. We want to make sure that there's a genuine connection there before going forward. Because 
there's a lot of options out there for the kids, but there's also a lot of kids out there that we're recruiting, and we want to we want to make sure we're finding the right ones for what we are looking for. Doesn't mean we'll get them all, but we want to make sure that we're not wasting our time on kids that aren't the fit for us. Mm -hmm. I think there's definitely something to be said to being selective and who you decide to bring on campus there. I think that definitely shows a great deal of diligence by your staff. Um, so obviously with the pandemic, everybody's been facing challenges and new ways and, and new ways of doing things. Um, how, do, how, does, how does your staff responded to the uh, pandemic? Uh, I have to give a big shout out to the assistant coaches for Coach Langoff, Coach Butts, Coach Affo, and then Coach Gibson got here kind of in the middle of all of this. But what we were able to do in the spring uh, with bringing in the class we brought in, largest class since 1978, um, we were only able to do that because my assistants came up with a great plan on the fly. Once we knew we weren't going to have kids on campus for visits, they put together a virtual tour, basically, and was able, they were able to send it out. Uh, it's a mixture of drone shots and inso, inside different classrooms and, and buildings, and that was able to be sent out via text message to all the kids we were recruiting. Out of the 33 first-year students we brought, I'd say half of them have never been on campus before they showed up for report day. Um, and that what doesn't happen without the coaches doing a great job of piecing together what our campus is like. We FaceTime with a ton of recruits. We had Zoom calls with the, with the recruits. I tutor on campus with my phone showing the recruit and their parents kind of what we had to offer. Mm -hmm. It was just showing, showing anything we could about what the, what the campus had to offer and get, get the students comfortable with what they could be walking into. So I think that, that's been a huge adjustment. Now, because we had more time to prepare for this second round now, we have a full-blown presentation we do. We do a virtual tour. We invite our, basically every other week we're doing Thursday and Saturdays, um, and we are giving a 45-minute to an hour-long presentation that includes a PowerPoint, includes my presentation on our philosophy and everything we've just sort of talked about, uh, and then from there going into um, virtual tour of, of power, uh, PowerPoint slides of campus and kind of go from there. I talk yeah. a little bit about that. Coach Butts talks about the powerhouse and weight room, and then Coach Lamp talks about Strong Stadium. That's great. So now we're going to dive into the fun part of our, of our program. We're going to go over some Beloit College football trivia with Coach Sankson. So our first question is going to be a true or false question. Beloit College was once in a lawsuit for using the name and mascot Buccaneers. That's true. Correct. They were sued by the Tampa Bay Buccaneers over the use of our, of our mascot. And we were, we were vindicated. They found enough difference that we were able to still use it. Uh, number two. What is the total number of offensive plays performed by the Beloit College football team in 2019? A, 437. B, 500. C, 573. Or D, 64. 500. Close. It's C, 573. Okay. Uh, third, how many years has Coach Stephen Wallstrom, a.k.a. Coach Wally, been a coach at Beloit College? Just at Beloit? Yep. He just finished his fourth year. That's correct. All right. He may deceive you with his vast amount of coaching <laughs> experience, but at Beloit he's only been here for four years. <laughs> Uh, which coach started their coaching career volunteering at Beloit College in 1997? I'm assuming Coach Warren. Correct. All right. After a successful playing career, he decided to he volunteered here and has been here ever since. Uh, number five. How many total yards did the football team have for the 2019 season? A, 1,624. <clears throat> B, 1,120. C, 3,023, or D, 2,100? 1,120. Close again, but it's going to be 1,624. Right. Next, um, <clears throat> who holds the record for most tackles in a game for Beloit College? A, Antonio Jones. B, Nelson Suarez. C, Patrick Nicholas. D, or D, Tony Beretti. Barati. That's correct. All right. <clears throat> uh, what are the most numbers of tackle made? What are the most number of tackles made in one game for Boyd College? A seventeen, B eighteen, C twenty five, or D thirty seven? Twenty five. Correct again. All right. In nineteen ninety one, Boyd football had its best record. What was it? A 
9 and 0, B, 9 and 1, C, 8 and 0, or D, 8 and 1? 9 and 1. That's correct again. That was under Coach George. Uh, Beloit, <clears throat> what team does Derek Carrier, the only current Beloit Buccaneer in the NFL, play for? Las Vegas Raiders. Correct again. Who holds the record for most passing yards in a game? A, Craig Racenet. Oops, sorry. B, Brian <clears throat> Mon. C, Dan Mulligan. Or D, Danny May. Danny May. Ah, it's going to be Brian Mong. Okay. If you were to put Coach Warren up there, I would have guessed him. <laughs> yeah. All, all great quarterbacks, though. What year did Beloit College play its first intercollegiate football game? A, 1889. B, 1894. C, 1902. Or D, 1909. 1889. That's correct. It was a it was a one season, one game season against with a victory against the University of Wisconsin. Very nice. There is only one jersey number that has been withdrawn from <clears throat> from circulation by the program in recent years. Which number is it? Sixty five. Correct. That was the number of Darth Winkler, a beloved a beloved football teammate and member of the Beloit College campus who unfortunately passed away in a tragic accident just after graduation. Finally. What famous NBA player did the coin toss at Beloit Col at a Beloit College homecoming game? You don't have to read them. <laughs> That's why I know that one. There you go. <laughs> All right. Well, really? Coach, you did very well in terms of trivia. Thank you. I think we can certify you as a winner. <laughs> All right. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me. That'll do it for today's episode of Beyond the Chalkboard with Beloit College Athletics. Thanks for joining us with Coach Sankson.